G'day everybody and welcome to The Hurt Box. Uh, this is a, a phenomenal opportunity to, to go global with what started off as a very, very small uh, Hunter Valley, Newcastle Hunter Valley focused enterprise. We're now going global. I'm, uh, I'm your co-host with my host, uh, Paul Amity. And tonight we bring you uh, international talent from all the way across the ditch, New Zealand, Myra Mola. Thank you so, so much for jumping on board the Hurt Box podcast tonight to be with us. We know it's late. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, such a pleasure to be here. Kia ora from Wellington, New Zealand. Um, we had some sun today, so this is a great way to wrap it up. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Mara. Cheers. Oh, sorry, you wanted to say something, Paul? No, well, I feel like my thunder's been stolen, but, you know, it is what it is. So really looking forward to the chat, Mara. I can't wait to hear your story. Now, Mara, can you take us back to the very first time uh, you rode a bike? Uh, it doesn't have to be that very first time, but just, you know, can you tell us about your first experience riding? Sounds pretty good. Um, if I can go back to my earliest memory, I must have been two or three, and I... Um, I had like this, you know, black kind of mullet helmet haircut. Um, I had this plastic trike and I had um, the, the the steep, in Wellington we've got these kind of terraced houses and we had the steep garden path with that kind of old school concrete with the nice little bumpy stones. And I can just remember the feeling of those stones like under the plastic wheels going like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> down the hill. And then as soon as I get to like the concrete, you know, the old school kind of colonial style um, stone walls, yeah. uh, I'd pull up, ram! <laughs> <laughs> my little cousin um, came to visit from Aussie and he was a, a year older, I think. And I remember him having a go and he just went straight down into the wall. Wow. And, it's almost well, like oh, a magnet. <laughs> I kind of set him up for that, but. I had a lot of practice, you know, screaming down that footpath of our family home wow. and hanging the right and, yeah, just loved it. I think the other cousin, because we had, you know, really good cousin years um, in our early childhood, one went down the bank. So from an early age, I kind of thought I like watching guys crash or, you know. <laughs> just, you know, a lot of fun. And I think, Great memories. Um, you know, growing up as a Kiwi kid, New Zealand had a lot of opportunities to do some pretty wild stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so and so you ended up in your cycling career, just for our listeners, you ended up doing everything from MTB to track cycling to duathlons to um, time trials to road racing. And, and now you've uh, just started doing uh, CX and cross events. What what an incredible uh, what an incredible gamut or what an, an incredible uh, experience you've had on the bike. Is there any of those disciplines that I've just mentioned that are, is your favourite? Is there any any one of those you thought, wow, I love this so much more than the other? It's so hard because I'm a total addict. So as soon as I get, I know I have to be careful about which discipline I choose because yeah. once I'm in place for it, like I I just have to dive in. Um, but I know that in my, I'd like to say, in my bones, it's cross country. Um, yeah. So cross country is, you know, like hard tails, those V brakes, um, bright clothes and lycra. Uh, I used to find banks before we had more trails um, and just go down <laughs> like the quarry, whatever. So yeah. um, I, I love that sense of adventure wow. and, you know, kind of, sense of exploring and finding new tracks and that was definitely instilled in me instilled in me at a young age and I think my first bike where I started going mountain biking my dad pulled um pulled a so there was neighbors had a basement there was a steel old three-speed mountain bike from the 1930s I don't know yeah yeah and then the neighbor gave it to me I could just touch the pedals and um, I used to mountain bike around on that so that's how I started. Yeah, and, and that was what around the age of fourteen was your I think your first race. Um, so I think that old three speed steel thing that I pulled out of the basement was um when I might have been around six or seven no no seven or eight maybe eight yeah. or nine um yeah. 
my first bike was when I I know kids are riding um, balance bikes now from the age yeah, of one. Yeah, to yeah. I rode my first bike without any training wheels or tracks at six. Um, so my granddad had a toy shop in Putararu where my dad's side grew up. They had a family home there. So he had he was such an entrepreneur. He had um, a baker, a few shops, and one of them was a toy shop. And uh, mm-hmm. my first bike was a little, um, looked like a chopper. Yeah, and yeah. It's called a budgie. And I just remember the feeling of doing figure eights in our family car park. And my dad taught me to do the figure eights. And I remember the paved stones. And some of them were wonky. And, like, recently I went um, on a hikoi, which means a, a journey. We yeah. follow your intuition where you need to go. Um, and I, I went on a path to see family and look at old places of my childhood. And the paved stones were still the same. Right. And that, like, 30 years later. So it's very sentimental my first time riding the budgie. Yeah. And Can I just... Can I just ask, Mara? You 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 you've sort of hit on a a pretty cool old school theme there of hardtails and V brakes, and I've certainly seen a picture of you online on an iron horse with what looks like, you know, it's definitely V brakes. Couldn't pick the fork. I'm going to say it's like a quad twenty one or something like that. I wasn't sure. Can you tell us what, what your first serious mountain bike was? What 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 brand was it? Holy moly. Are you ready to go on a time walk? Um, yes. Okay. So I was, um, oh, my gosh. So I got into mountain biking basically because of the bike community. Like I was treated like a little sister. People put stuff together to get me going. My first bike was my dad's um, old specialised rock hopper. Wow. And it was a men's medium. And I was 12. So oh. we... <laughs> We jazzed it up and I was away. And then what happened is um, it was the 19, was it, oh, gosh, Paolo Peso raced the World Cup in my hometown in Mount Victoria, Wellington. Um, wow, little, we are going back. This is wow. good. Yeah. Awesome. We're wearing the gold pincer in the gold Gary Fisher. Yep. And I was wearing my dad's specialised rock hopper and I rode up with him to watch race. And there were the sponsored tents, and I remember the giant tent, and um, and I, I saw um, her doing the the drops. You know, there were some sections with some technical drop off ledges, um, and she was riding down. And the moment I saw her ride those routes and the drop, I I knew that's what I want to do. Wow, I, was, that's great. I think I was maybe twelve or thirteen then. Wow. Twelve, yeah, just about to start high school. And how did you how did you end up going from from there to to going over to the United States and racing in the US? That's quite a jump, eh? Hey? Well, we you know, can come I, back if you want. Um. So what happened is when I saw her do that, I went curious and had a look in the sponsorship tents. There was a guy in the the giant tent, and you know how kids kind of have this um, longing for something they want to have, and they just you can see the eyes kind of go starstruck. That's how I felt when I saw this yellow race yellow yeah um giant mountain bike and i was just like Ugh. and like the new rubber tires like the, the black smell of black you know the yeah, rubber. yeah 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 um, like everything was new and um the guy said hey you can take it for a test spin so i jumped on it had a ride and i was just grinning at the air like <laughs> <laughs> awesome yes <laughs> give me more and he said to me I don't know who the person was, but he said, hey, the, um, the New Zealand champs are held on this course um, in, you know, a few weeks. It might have been a couple of weeks. Um, he said, if you win um, on that bike, um, we'll sponsor you. Wow. So from there it was on. I was building my own little trails around my house in the forest where I grew up, um, and I was practising the drops, practising the drops, Again, 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 extending it, building it, making it better. Um, and yeah, I was a, at that stage, I was a junior running champ. Wow. So I was undefeated in my cross country running till I was 14. So cross country was how I grew up from age five or six to 14. 
and my auntie was an Olympian runner, so yeah. we grew up. Well, I grew up watching, you know, what she was up to on the TV for Olympics. I had an uncle, so she was racing Olympics when I was born through my early years, and then um, my uncle Richard Pittman, that's my mum's side, her first cousin, um, he did four Olympics for Cook Islands, and he was often training from her home too. So. Not only that, my dad employed six Olympians at one point. Wow. So I was surrounded by legends. What a so, great influence. Wow. Yeah. And your, so your I, aunt went on to win bronze in the marathon as well, didn't she? She did. And I, I love it so much more now because I understand like, there, you know, there have been drugs in sport throughout, throughout mm. time. Mm. And some athletes who no stay true and their race was you know real for all time too mm, mm. yeah that yep. that's a good point so yeah basically i went um i did my little training on my own i've always trained myself because i learned how to listen to my body i've yep. got so much information that's in there if i listen to my dad or not <laughs> it's in there yeah. um and i i discovered that my running lungs and i was also a trained swimmer so we did competitive swimming since we were five to age 14. And that was mainly to help with my asthma, my terrible wow. asthma. Um, so bad that I'd get sent in my early years through primary school to Rarotonga to school in winter months. Oh, right. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah, that's how bad my asthma was. So yeah, swimming, right. I managed it. Um, and running, um, running was a challenge for my asthma. However, biking was great because it kind of, um, relax my lungs, um, and I, you know, in the position where you can open up your. Yeah. <laughs> so I became a hill climber. Like, uh, so that guy said, win the race on your dad's bike. Um, and of course, he's a nice little kick and a climb. Being a, a whippet running, swimming <laughs> team uh, with some technical skills, I was off um, up the hills. I won my age group or whatever it was. But after that, um, I was sponsored. I got an offer from Iron Horse. Wow. Um, oh, my gosh. Bob Pratt, he's a legend in our um, cycling community. He's just recently passed, I think it was last year. Oh. Very um, however, he believed in me and he saw me as a talent and he, I had my own little, I had my tailor. I had a tailor to make me clothes that was, that was small enough. Oh, wow. I'll team on New Zealand, shout out to them because they were fantastic dressing me. Um, yeah. And uh, the persimmon orange was the colour of my season. So that was hot in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> and glasses and the lime, <laughs> the lime pistachio going on. I don't know what it was, but well, <laughs> it was. That's got to be so exciting, though. I mean, that's that's every kid's dream. I mean, I think Simon still has a dream that he'll get sponsored one day. But, you know, <laughs> can you tell us that, that that must have felt amazing as a kid to be, what were, were you given the bike? Oh, man, like um, presented a bike with Aroha. You know, that's that's awesome. And, wow. you know, I think that, the, you know, maybe kids can take things for granted, but when you have that kind of belief and, you know, you've worked for, what you've you've got and it's a team mm. you're not just taking it's like if you guys believe in me to give me this gear i'm going to ride my best for this team That's so cool. i'd i'd be off even uh, at high school i'd ride my bike to school it's the only girl that ride to high school um at, in those days uh because mountain biking was really new in the 90s yeah. and at lunchtime i'd skip skip out <laughs> to go mountain biking um, in the local tracks. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I'd often uh, meet the high school boys, you know, and go downhilling. So my little hardtail, um, I remember, you know, being taken in by the local community of downhillers as well. Wow. And I would follow their tail and drop in. And I, I just remember one thing I had on my side was always I was quite fearless. So yeah, yeah. Put me in my down. No, I think it's healthy. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, there's definitely something where if it gets scary, I just know how to relax. 
relax into it and I started practicing that quite young. And you mentioned your training and you said you've got a lot of you know notes in your mind of your training. Did you follow a specific program? Did you, you know, find something that worked for you better than anything else? What was it what was it you did most of all? I think because I I grew up with running training and swimming training and with um, Olympic athletes around me, I would look quite um, it was quite a I wouldn't go too hard on a short short term basis I'd look longer and um, one of the greatest running coaches in history you may or may not know is Arthur Lydiard so great book yeah you can um, adapt that to any sport so yeah. for me it's quite natural that because um, I, I usually get an idea or, or a vision mm. uh, or if I get a goal it's like okay there's my goal and then I map it backwards all the way back and kind of judge like how good I can get like, from where I want to be first. Mm -hmm. It's not like how yeah. good can I get, like, I want to be here yeah. and then I go back. Um, so I go through those cycles and it means I can manage, I can have more peaks and then I can build up over the years too. Yeah. I think that might be why um, I've been able to, I've been riding for like, maybe 20 years in elite, um, but I've come in and out a lot. And like, it would have been great if I could have had a more steady run had I been able to be a paid professional <laughs> or, you know, you know, more sustainable. But Yeah, I read, I read a note about. from your dad which said that you had difficulty attracting sponsorship. He mentioned you'd done so well in the National Road Series here in Australia. You're ranked number three. I mean, I saw your results from the Canberra Tour in 2010 where you were sitting in third place in an incredibly challenging course and you didn't have any sponsorship. How did that feel? Uh, how did that feel for you? Um, actually, I don't look at it that way. Um, I had an amazing community around me. Um, I know that it's quite um, an introverted life when you wake up in the darkness and you <laughs> shop your coffee and yeah. put things on, kind of wake up when the sun's coming up and you've done your ride. So, yeah, uh, yeah doing those long days on a bike, it's quite, it can be when you're doing the, the training um it's quite repetitive and it's quiet it can be quiet life um, yeah. so really opportunities for camaraderie and those social rides when you get to see teammates um but i found that the sponsorship it usually comes after you've put out the goods mm. so there can be long periods where you have to go and tuck yourself away you might be living like you're a horse in a stable for a while um but that you know when you when you do have good results, um, I think, you know, there are rewards to reap and people get behind you. And I think it is something to manage. Like if you are, um, if you love the limelight <laughs> and, you know, the, the buzz and the adrenaline and the highs of the event of racing, mm. Mm. Um, a little can bit you, difficult after that. Can, can you tell us about that experience of going to the US? How did that feel? That would have been quite daunting, surely. All right, let's talk daunting for a Kiwi girl. So, <laughs> um, I worked through my high school years, saved money to go on the first plane to LA when I finished high school. So I had booked it um, pretty much the day after I finished my last at high school. Packed my bike bag. I just so you're 17, 18? Yeah. 17. Wow. Um, and I arrived and I just had a huge suitcase of clothes because at that age, my life, that was my, that was my clothes. Mm. Little t-shirts and shirts and things like, I don't know why I needed so much, but that was the <laughs> And then my bike. <laughs> and um, I arrived in LA in a, like, a little pink singlet and a mini skirt. <laughs> I was just so tiny and kiwi. And I just had this you know, big smile, and I got around everywhere so easily because, you know, and all Americans are like, you're so cute. I can't believe you actually talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> Being a Kiwi, oh, my gosh, you don't know what you can't do. Yeah. I think when I grew up, you don't have any limitations. So we kind of had this sheltered innocence in New Zealand where, where we – we aren't told any limits, um, mm. so I just went over and did whatever I wanted to do. Um, 
I was really lucky to have my auntie in LA and another auntie in Boulder. So they were my two go-tos. So I started off in Boulder, Colorado. I um, was very lucky to have an auntie in professional sport and athletes who had already come through, you know, under her wing. So I was um, really lucky to have the opportunity. Um, of course, she introduced me to the best people she knew in the cycling world. Yeah, um, sure. I imagine there'd be yeah. plenty of superstars there at that stage. Oh, it's such a different world. Like, first of all, I had to adapt to the, um, how do you call it? The altitude. Yes, thank you. It's getting late. <laughs> the altitude. So, of course, because I had so much chapstick, you know, it was like every girl had flavours of chapstick. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I used <laughs> to go to the shops in Boulder in the first week or so. I put chapstick in my nose because it would be so dry. Um, I definitely adapted and um, from Boulder at 5,000 5, feet, is it? Um, I then went to 10,000 feet to work and train on a ranch in the Tarial Mountains. Um, so I was working at, um, as an assistant adventure guide. So that was a great experience. Hmm. And uh, on in the staff, there was um, a, a rider who was also trained, a couple of riders who were doing the World Cup series or going to them at least to go on the expert grade. So I went and raced elite. So I did my first World Cup in Durango. My first yeah. World Cup ever was when I was 14, though. That was in Australia. And I won the under 19 at age 14. And in Sydney, was it? Oh. Um, and then I was on the podium with Cadell Evans. Oh, cool. Wow. That's a nice story. Later. And, Ooh. you know, um, so I, I, yeah, I'm just glad to be a part of that history back in the cross country days. And in USA, Durango, I remember seeing um, riders there from the New Zealand team. So um, Kashi Lurks, he took, he helped me out on the road there. And um, of course, John Picoldi, our legendary downhiller, um, Missy Giovi as well. Um, and gosh, the woman who I noticed when I was 17, um, I, w I was always good at starting. So I could get through little gaps and I'd get from the back. <laughs> and, uh, and I think starting at place 99, wow. like place 99, and I worked my way all up to place 30. Oh. Um, and, I'm, I'm one who really gets egged on by the crowd. Um, the crowds are amazing, so they're going, hello, hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and it's like a real, like a Red Bull kind of party party vibe. Oh, and yeah. I loved it. Loved it. And um, so, yeah, egged on by the crowd. I mean, I had to do every A-line, and um, I have to stay on every uphill, you know. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's something I really enjoy. Awesome. What a great experience. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I uh, got to ride at 12,000 feet um, in the mountains as well. Um, amongst, I did the USA series, so I think the best I came was a second and a third in elite um, in the series. So I raced all around the state. Yeah, wow. so I, That's great. I got around okay. And so you got, um, you got what, so noticed by the New Zealand, you got noticed by the New Zealand team around that time then? I was on the New Zealand team, I think, when I was 14, 13 or 14. Wow. Um, I was one of the first athletes in the New Zealand Academy of Sport and that was founded. So that's pretty special to me. Very. I remember modelling the first tracksuit. All right. First initial batch, batch of elites and I was mentored um, by an, a phenomenal athlete who's a mountain running legend here called um, Melissa Moon. Wow. Um, and my one of the cyclists I really look up there are there are many, but Susie Pride um, was one of my idols. And I remember doing one um, a nationals um, cross country mountain bike race once, and I was dying in the ass. I couldn't get my clip. <laughs> out. It was like oh, you know, when you just feel like you're going backwards. And then I saw Susie Pride on the sideline. She said, "Go, Myra," and it was like my hero wow. me. and I um it's like someone bolted me with lightning and I just went <laughs> like boom 
and like, my mentality switched to wow. oh shit um, and I bolted like a horse and I always remembered my change in pace because of my um, mental <laughs> mental state yeah. so that moment like I tapped on that a lot um, in my road racing years later because with road cycling um, being longer distance and the teamwork you have those crunch moments but like everyone's hanging in there until you have that crunch done where you yeah. either make a break and you're like, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. I'm still going. Yeah. And I could always knew that I had that tool that, like, oh, shit, imagine that there's someone watching <laughs> who I really like. Um, yeah. That, and you would use that, like, would you? You would use that as a mental tool to see you through. I've got so many tricks up my sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> Please, do tell, do tell. Do tell. <laughs> Because I always lights out. I, as soon as it gets hard, I just switch off completely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe I don't go that far. Go that far. But I have um, discovered cyclocross. Um, so that put me in the when I saw you know when we talk on the hurt box. I thought, yeah, that sums up cyclocross for me. Wow. <laughs> hurt box. Tell us about that. The the difference in intensity between cyclocross and cross country mountain biking. It's a hard one because um, I think that I always thought mountain biking is closer to time trial. Yeah. And uh, like, you know, when you see a fresh mountain biker come into a road race, you can mm. kind of tell because they want to go, they want to give it away, you know, the whole time. Um, Whereas roadies kind of like, yeah, save it for the right moments mm. and they can hold back a bit. Um, so I think cyclocross and cross country, cross country has been a while, a while now, but I think cyclocross is, um, I really like it because it's more of a cross of road and yeah. like a time trial, um, cross country mountain bike, old school. So you can, mm. those old kind of like drifting on corners and, and it's safe enough you can cut people off, you know, not like road. You're going to chop people. Um, uh, but it's like uh, the best thing in cyclocross. I'm kind of in love with cyclocross because it gives me the buzz of cross country. Yeah. I can, I'm in the drops, you know, that's cool. I really enjoy the drops. Yeah. Cyclocross seems to be making a real, not a comeback, but it's certainly popularity with Vanderpool, Van Art. Tom Pidcock, those guys bringing that back to the road and just taking it another level. It's it's impressive. And I think there's been a lot of road riders now, like Heinrich Hausler, doing that in his off-season mm. because the level of it, it's got to be super hard. Mm. Oh, like, if you know, cross-country running was hard. Like, I grew up cross-country running, and that was horrible. Like, I just <laughs> Oh, Dad takes for runs, like ten k or so up in the rain, and yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I was just glad when it was over. And then with cross country running, I'd say just one more corner, one more corner. And then I knew when he said that it'd be eleven more corners. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I was suspicious as well. Um, and yeah, I think that's the um, thing I like about cyclocross is that even if it's muddy, um. You know, Belgian weather, it's it brings out that toughness in you, like that grit. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's what I love about, um, you know, like the pioneers of mountain biking. Um, there's, you know, a woman called Kathy, Kathy Lynch, who was just like hardcore woman racer on a mountain bike that would scare the crap out of men. Mm. And she got inspired me because when I was um, – doing races like the old school Karapoti Classic, um, I just loved tearing down the hill and cutting off men. They, girl, coming through. Mm. <laughs> 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 and they're like, girl, coming through. Um, you know, it's <laughs> so much fun. But I, I just loved how there were just these really tough women. And when I came across the road cycling, I remember um, being taken under the wing for a while, your legend, Kathy Watt. And yeah. Holy moly, like, that's a tough Aussie woman. Um, I've met, you know, some really good quality 
Aussie woman on on in racing that have inspired me. You know that real, you know, grit. Don't give a crap. You know, mm. coming mm. through. That's what you need. You need that. You know, grit. And I think in Tassie they call it the pig. Yeah, I don't know what that. Means. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Myra, Myra, we've got a couple of minutes left. We've been talking for a bit now. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, but just one, one, one last question from me, then I'll throw over to Paul. Um, you know, your career, you've done you've done everything. I think there's, you know, that's the, the pretty complete cyclist in anyone's uh, book. Is there anything that you would have done differently, any path you would have chosen or any, you know, we all sometimes we like to reminisce or go back in time. Is there anything you would have done differently or any advice to the young, both, you know, female and, and male cyclists out there given your experience? Hmm. I think that um, I probably put a lot of pressure on myself. And the journey to where I've come to now, like I did, um, I've, I've had my daughter, so that's yeah, enough. Yeah. Congratulations. But, um, there's, thank you. There's, uh, I knew when I was 17, I was racing mums, like world champions who yeah. were in the 40s. And so I always had the idea in my head that I'm only going to get stronger. And I think that's a really good message is just know that you're always going to get stronger. Even if you don't get faster, you're going to get smarter. Um, you know, your training might get more efficient, you'll do less. And putting pressure on yourself, like, yeah, I wish I'd just gone a bit easier on myself. Mm. Um, because I didn't need to. Now I'm learning how to fall in love with cycling in new ways, it's cyclocross. Mm. And it's, yeah, um, enjoying it for me. So uh, mm. the last race I did was, um, we've got the revolution of hut cross. So we've got, um, a cyclocross movement happening and Kim Hurst who I used to race with um, she was uh, a top top champion in New Zealand and we raced together at the World Cup too and she started the cyclocross series in Wellington and we had up to she's got up to 300 or more riders now so it's just uh, wow that's awesome inspiration from England and started mighty cross children racing so we've got kids out there and um the great thing about cyclocross is I turned up, I'm a new mum on you know, my own. I can't justify buying the gear I used to ride right yet. Mm. Um, I had a look and she goes, hey, you got a race and you can you can borrow my bike. She gave me her last World Cup racing bike, the cowboy, cowbell bike. Um, the top, top gear and I was away laughing. I was actually cried when she gave me a bike because, oh. you know, I had advice to put my daughter first for this time and to have a break like that and to be able to do an event where I can race around a paddock uh, for an hour have a blast give it all but leave it all out there my daughter can cheer me on this is just the best sport for accessibility um I don't have to spend hours out in the mountains 100ks get a flat and think about who's going to get my daughter from daycare um mm. bike across is just absolute gold so grateful for Kim Give me that opportunity. Thing is, she said, Nash Cyclocross Nationals are in three weeks. Do you want to race <laughs> Agra? Um, and I was like, <laughs> can't believe I'm doing this, but okay. So after three weeks training, um, I was entered in a UCI event. I pulled up <laughs> after, you know, no training since having a daughter who's now, you know, three. Um, I pulled out my my Cook Islands uniform. I did as many rides as I could, good quality. My dad is a, um, a world champion in his age group, UCI champ. My sister's, um, after three years training, 10th in New Zealand in cross country, elite. She's amazing. Um, so I'm on the start line with those two as well. Um, a field of 50 women at the national champs. I pulled up my old skin suit from 2016, my last World Cup for Cook Islands. I can get in it. But yeah. it's not perfect. Um, and you know what? I was like, I'm so stoked to be on a bike. Yeah. I don't give a rat's what I look like. Yeah. Like, even though I was cute when I was 20, like, I feel so much better now. Um, yeah. awesome. I'm racing for my family. My bike community's there. My best friends with their babies are watching me cheering. Um, my dad's and my sister's there. Like, really, that Nationals event was a dream come true. Yeah. I um. I'm still quick at starting. Um, I went straight into um, Sammy, the New Zealand cross-country champ. 
in the front. And I thought, be patient, Myra. Don't leave this out. You're unfit. So I stuck to the wheel. Good idea. Kate McCoy, legend, four-time Olympian, on the, um, right behind me. Soon enough, um, we did the first two laps together. Um, in the top three, and we've broken from the main pack. Um, so this is National Champ Cyclocross in Wellington. Um, yeah, Cycling New Zealand, amazing support there. Um, amazing organisation. Pretty much after two laps, I found myself in no man's land. Yeah. So <laughs> I've uh, remembered how to do it and then remembered that I'm really unfit. I just put <laughs> my head down and suffered. Um, suffered so hard to stay away from my before. sister. This was the first time I've ever raced my sister. Um, there were bets going on who would be the better sister, uh, fighting for our dad's love. You know, this is... <laughs> <fun>. <laughs> And um, it was great entertainment um, for the crowd, but pretty much I managed to stay away from her, which was really tough. But I ended up coming third, and I um, and my sister well, came well. fourth. What happened is because I'm UCI registered as a Cook Islander, um, my sister got to take my medal. So I got third, but she got bronze in New Zealand, you know, gold. Well, um, yeah. um, up coming third each and I you know really couldn't have worked it out better to keep my relationship with my sister and also be there you know that's so beautiful we, I love we it both, she's on the podium um they yes. gave me a really good thank you as a Cook Islander um I dedicated that race to my island of Rakahanga so Rakahanga Coral Atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean um you know tribute that to my family so for me, I've represented New Zealand, represented Cook Islands, and now I've represented Rakahanga. I'm pretty happy. With Unbelievable. That. Yeah. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. I, I'm a bit <laughs> lost for words, which, which, is a first, which is a first for me. I've got, I've got to say, though, look, I, I love your story. It's an amazing story. You. You, you have a real infectious personality and it's been so interesting to listen to, to your whole journey. One of the really interesting things I'd like to quickly ask you, and I know I'm going to get kicked off in a second, is <laughs> as a teenage girl, often, you know, I think most people have seen really promising athletes, both girls and, and males as well, get that distraction and, and, and give it away and go to something else. And I, I'm really interested to see. I'm sure you would have been in the minority mm -hmm. in mountain biking in New Zealand as a 14-year-old. What what kept you? You know, you're saying 20 years. It's just mind blowing. What kept you, you know, passionate about it? Wow, I think it might be my personality <laughs> because um, I'm. I'm a little bit of an addict, you know. <laughs> it comes to bike. I like speed. And I don't think it's normal. Like, I'm so glad my daughter didn't turn out like me. And, you know, she's unique in her way. But mm. she doesn't need to go fast. She can slow down. She can stop her bike and sniff the flowers. Me, I've just got to keep going and going. And I think um, cycling, why I came back to it is it um, it gave me that, it's like that, that base and, you know, happy place where you can, uh, I don't know, reground yourself or it's it's also a social leveller and I'm a people person. So mm. um, it doesn't matter if you're 100 years old. I might have ridden with someone who's 100 years old and they're really slow, but I'd go up the mountain and down and up and down and we'd have both end up at the top eventually and, and you get to know um, people of all walks of life. And I think that it's been my way to connect with people um, being interested in people and um, I, I never travel just for traveling's sake I always like to have a, a goal and mm. you know with like minds um, so coming back to cycling yeah there's just something about it it's like a fish jumping back in water yeah, yeah. awesome <laughs> thank you so much yeah, look, thanks, Mara. Unfortunately, we're going to have to bring it to a to a close. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you tonight. 
I cannot thank you enough. Uh, we'll put this up on our uh, YouTube channel and put a link to it on Facebook. But huge, um, huge thanks to you tonight. It's been incredible to hear parts of your story. Um, and yeah, could not, could not, uh, yeah, your stories are incredible. Uh, from, from, you know, from everything you've done, track cycling to, 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 to road, to time trial, to mountain bike, you've even got a book uh, out uh, about you and your training. Yeah. yeah. And you've even just been in a, in a bank New Zealand ad as well. So we're picking you up really at the the peak of your uh, at the peak of your popularity. And but. now you're on the Hurt Box podcast. Like you know, the sky's oh. the limit, really. Thank Thank you. you. Thank I'm you. Such thank an honour, guys. I really enjoyed talking to you tonight. Thank you so much for having me and connecting across the ditch. Yeah. Can't wait to get back to Aussie. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, and um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you when you come over. So thanks, thank you so much. Thank you. Night, good, good night from us. Good night. Cheers, mate.